Okay, I'd like to welcome you to lesson 1.2 for my GCSE poetry unit. Um, we're looking today, we looked at Percy B. Shelley, we looked at the Approaching an Unseen Poem. This is a creative writing unit, just getting you exposed to a lot of poems and a lot of poets that are on the course um, to think about how to approach and respond to unseen poetry. And what we're going to think about are some of the big ideas, um, different approaches of how to read um, getting into the poems through some close questioning and I could give you some guided reading and annotation and we will be doing some creative writing and some journal response as well. Okay. So, as with any lesson I would teach, I want you to be talking and if you can't be talking you should pause and just write down some ideas. Um, so here I'm going to start. Um, you can pause at any time. Here, these are opinion lines, and I want you to read through the statements and discuss. Um, and if you're with yourself, you're going to just write your own. Um, religions about freedom, or religions about control. We need to follow rules to be free. Freedom from rules is real freedom. The rich earn money and merit God's rewards. Everyone deserves love, regardless of success or failure. In heaven you will be rewarded. Heaven and er hell exist on earth. So if you could just pause and work through those, and it's important that you do that because it's already anticipating what the poems will be about. And if you do this exercise, when we read the poems of Blake, you'll find them easier to get into. Okay, so now you've done that. We're going to start. Here's, here's what my starter uh, page would usually look like. I just copied it. There's a portrait actually of uh, Blake. Um, it's amazing. Look at those eyes looking out in the distance. Truly remarkable. Um, one of our great, great poets. Um, he was also a painter and an illustrator. And um, I want you to look at these three paintings um, of his. And uh, what details do you notice in these paintings? And I want you to predict what, what themes you're going to see in his poetry. So if I was doing this, I would look at that amazing those amazing angels and that vivid, um, that sense of divinity above death, that there's something higher. Um, uh, in the middle image, I get the image of an old man, perhaps God uh, creating the world and that, that creation from above to below. Um, and strangely, the beginning is this square hand, which I think is really remarkable. Um, it's quite a magical image, um, quite a powerful image. And the final one, is of another different type of man bending down, but instead of making, strangely, it's the same shape, but it's a kind of measurement. Um, and I'm wondering about what the difference is between creation and measurement. Um, if I was to predict, I would predict that there's something, this writer is interested in God and the divine and something about the way humans uh, interact with the divine. That's how I would have conducted this exercise. So this is a poem uh, of his uh, called uh, The Garden of Love. Um, and it's the first one. There are a few poems of his in the booklet, but this is the one I want you to look at. And what we do when we read a poem is we, we just read it. And we read it at least twice. And then we read it by marking lines that might interest us. Um, marking lines that we like, marking lines that we think are important, marking words or lines that we want to know more about, underlining things that we want to discuss in greater depth. Um, in addition to making these symbols on top of poems, what we should do is write our first ideas on them. So I'm not going to go immediately to the visualizer. I'm going to read the poem out to you, and I want you to read along um, and then pause, and I'd like you to to do the exercise because I'm not going to read it multiple times in the interest of time. So this is called The Garden of Love by William Blake. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds 
and binding with briars my joys and desires. It's it's a it's an absolutely magical uh, poem. It it works. It's magic on me every time. I really highly recommend you read the poem out loud. Try to pause only at uh, the punctuation marks and try not to overemphasize the rhyme. Try to go against that. Okay, so if you pause and read through the poem at least twice and and just try to mark it up. Okay. Structural analysis. Let's look at these. Let's look at these three stanzas. I want you to think about um, before I do the poem with you, um, and saw what I never had seen in the first stanza. How can you see what you've not seen? Shut and thou shalt not. Why does Blake contrast rules thou shalt not to love the garden of love? Um, priests in black gowns were walking the rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. What's this final image give us a feeling of Blake's attitude to religion? What do you think he feels about religion? And in fact, you could go through the whole poem and look at what you think he feels. Okay, so if you pause and do that now. You know, this is a really famous poem. So if you wanted to just go on the internet and just find out what every critic or every reader thinks and you want to find out all the secrets, you could do that. But all I've done over time is just read and read and read. And that's all I want you to do, too. I want you to learn to read the poem multiple times to find out what is going on and how do you respond. So let me let me just try to model that. I went to the Garden of Love. I mean, what is what is this? What is this? Where is this? And saw what I never had seen contradiction saw never seen a chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green so here we have the church versus nature already and the gates of this chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door the rules don't 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 rules so i turned to this garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore so again again we we have the church versus nature and turning away turning away from this he doesn't like rules he wants he wants a sweetness of of love and still, I don't know where we are. And, 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 and I saw it was filled with graves. Whoa. Tombstones instead of flowers. And instead of love, priests in black gowns walking their rounds, binding with briars my joys and desires so what i get is this image of this walking around briars are kind of thorns and binding is holding destroying joy and desire it's a really odd linking joy and desire um, desire seemingly something negative at times certainly the priest thinks so because that's why they want to control it but here it's something he likes um and here we get an easy way to do structure where we have three stanzas really clearly drawn out and there's something about this garden versus what is going on in nature and this this place of love um so i'm i'm trying to read the poem as if it's fresh but uh, I'm more familiar with it perhaps than you are, but I would really recommend you just read it and, and go back into those tensions between the, the nature and, um, and the church. Um, so to give you some, just before we move on, that's just my first reading of it. If you could spend five minutes, if you could pause, now you have to use evidence. So I would encourage you to use at least one image quotation word from each stanza or something a pattern that you think emerges um 
I want you to think about how does Blake show his political anger in ways similar or different to Shelley, Shelley who we did in the last um, lesson. How does Blake show his emotions about religion? What is Blake's idea about nature and religion? Or you can write about anything that occurs to you about this poem. So if you just pause now and spend five minutes doing that, just your own ideas, um, that would be really crucial. Okay, so hopefully you've paused, you've read the poem, you've annotated, you've read it a bunch of times, you've annotated along with me, and now it's time um, to just think a little bit more about the poem. Um, for me, the poem makes me think of the Garden of Love, makes me think about the Garden of Eden. Um, these rules uh, remind me of things in the Old Testament, um, the, the laws that were presented by Moses, the rules prohibiting what to do. Um, the idea of briars, binding with briars, the image that comes to me is of uh, Jesus's suffering and the crown of thorns that he wore. I don't know why, but ever since I was young and I read this poem, I got that image. Um, that movement of them going their rounds really makes me see those that, 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 that crown of thorns in my mind. I, I don't know if he's meant to give me that image, but that's the image I have. But what I do know is that it's negative. And the, that those priests wearing black are not flowers, and they represent death and negativity and rules. And what I want you to think about is, is this poem pro or anti-religious? It's soaked in the imagery of Catholicism, Christianity rather. Is it, is it pro-religion? Is it anti-religion? Is it both? Is it none? Is it just playing with the, these these things do you have to know any uh, here's the other thing that's great about blake i would challenge like do you need to know any of this religious stuff to actually enjoy the poem i don't i'm not entirely certain you do okay so just coming out of that poem i want us to think about his images a little more um this is a painting um so he he etched these poems in this very famous book Songs of Innocence and Experience, and this is one of the experience poems, all the poems we're going to look at. We're only looking at two, but they're from the experience poems. How, do, how does Blake use images to enhance the meaning of his poems? So if you look at that image, um, does it speak to the poem in any way? Um, does it speak against it? What is the image trying to do? Do you see, I think I see a snake in the uh, illustration there. What, what is it? What are, where's the green? Where's the flowers? Um, what is he trying to do with the imagery? Um, if we move on to the poem we're going to study now, which is London, uh, look at the image there. Uh, predict. Prediction is a major step to reading, by the way. It's not a random one. Um, this is a poem called London, a city that my students uh, study and live in. Uh, and and uh, I want you to think about what, what's this poem going to be about. Okay, so if you write down some predictions now... Um, you can pause. Okay, let's let's again practice um, what it means to read through this poem. I'm going to read through it once. You should read through it twice um, to try and think about how are you going to start to take control. And by that, I mean how are you going to annotate the poem to, to, to engage with it, to try and make it your own, to make sense of what's going on. Um, one of the hints that we have in reading poetry is the use of stanzas. Um, the use of full stops for full thoughts, um, the uh, idea of repetition or rhyme sometimes to help unify. But the first time we read it, let's just let's just let ourselves hear. And then the second time and the third time, you should try and find things that are a little bit more uh, detailed. So here we go. London. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet Marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forge manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most, through midnight streets, I hear how the youthful harlots curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. 
Well, the, the version I've given you up here is a little bit different. I, I'm missing some of the punctuation. That's why I hesitated. I'm going to do it again when I annotate. But if you could just pause now and just respond to the poem, read through it again, and just give it your first response. What You have the, the copy of the poem on page 12 of your booklet. If you could, if you could just kind of give it your first reading. Um, and I'm just going to show you some images that make me think of the poem, of wandering through London and seeing the sadness of everybody's face, um, manacles, kind of, uh, what are these called? Handcuffs, chains. They, they make me think of slavery. They make me think of um, things uh, that bind us, that punish us. Um, there's a lot of vocabulary that you might that you might want to know to help you, but before you do any of that, you know, I just want you to think about the images of the poem, uh, chimney sweepers and what soldiers have to do, um, the prostitution uh, and vice of London, and that and that that confused image of the marriage. Hearse. Hearses were for funerals. Marriage, uh, marriage carriages would be something to celebrate, but a marriage hearse, like that, that conflicted image is really quite powerful. Um, so before I give you the structure, why don't I read the poem with you? And this version that is printed in your booklet has the actual accurate uh, punctuation. So let me just try to locate the whole poem on the page there. Um, uh, I wander through each chartered street where the chartered Thames does flow. So chartered, if you go back to that vocabulary slide, which of course I'm sending the lesson on Google Classroom, chartered street um, is, is, um, is mapped out, uh, controlled. Um, but, but the river, the river can't be right away you get this tension between control and 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 just release um uh but what he sees um what he notices what he notices are uh marks so again he keeps he changes the meaning and the use of words um uh in fact let me just look again what chartered means um mapped out controlled yeah so i wander through each chartered street where the chartered where the mapped out thames does flow and and notice i notice in every face marks as he signs of weakness and marks of woe look at that one two three times that repetition um weakness woe sadness and misery in London. Why? Why? What's going on? Because in every everywhere he goes, he hears things. Okay? And what does he hear? Cry of men. Infants cry of fear. Um, in every shout, what he hears is the mind forge manacles. Those handcuffs. Okay, but those handcuffs, he hears them, he hears them clanging, maybe. He hears cries, and what he hears is handcuffs made, forged, as if uh, by a blacksmith, um, uh, made in the mind. We are slaves in the mind, he hear, and he hears it because he hears everyone crying and, and being afraid and, and uh, making, you know, bans here are, are restrictions and rules. Again, just like in um, the Garden of Love, thou shall not. He just hears this internal slavery that we have. How the chimney sweepers cry every blackening church appalls so these these children who clean 
chimneys. They should appall and make black those churches. And and the soldiers cries, the image is of uh, blood flowing, blood flowing down palace walls. So so these things, these these hypocrisies and injustices, he he can see them, he hallucinates them, he, he they're vivid to him. Um, but the most, the biggest thing that he hears is uh, the young prostitute curse, and it how it blasts. So the prostitute, the young prostitute, her youth matters, cursing the baby with plague, just just you know putting a curse blight. And what it does is it in the same. Oh, I never noticed this. What 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 the what the chimneys what the children are doing to the church, and the soldiers doing to the palace. This 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 young prostitute is 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 exposing the hypocrisy and the death within the marriage hearse in the same way. Wow, that's amazing. I've read this poem so much, and I all I just found something new. That's kind of remarkable to me so this last image is is horrific and brutal um the other thing you could think about um if you haven't noticed is that this is a this is a day from morning to night and what the character or the speaker in this poem of blake's and you you shouldn't take it as blake himself but a character that blake has created in the poem um the speaker of this poem is 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 just wandering around london and hearing and hallucinating and seeing the injustices that are in this place that we call London, this this unjust and unequal um, and horrific place where people we're, we're enslaving ourselves. That's that is essentially Blake's vision of London. And the structure of the poem is, and I'm giving this to you to help to give you a foot up. Sorry about the punctuation on the slide. You're going to need to use the booklet. Um, the first stanza is about control and freedom. In the second stanza, he hears the self-slavery, the sounds of misery, and then this horrific image of a diseased society that ends the poem. Um, if we go for language analysis, um, we get the idea of wander and charter, um, the idea of flowing and controlling, weakness and woe, the, the, the interlinking through alliteration, those words, this, this idea of sadness, this, this monotony through repetition, that very powerful metaphor, that image of those mind-forged manacles, that's something you have to really, he's burned that into our language, into our collective literary history. The sounds of misery, and finally, that horrific image excuse me, that closes the poem. Those are the things that are worth analyzing and digging into. Again, for your own studies, I would recommend for the, for the poems you need to know for the, for the exam. But just for yourself, you should create a quote list of, of lines from poems that strike you or, or have some resonance with you or confuse you or make you think about something, anything, any emotion, if there's a word, if there's vocabulary that you don't know or that you want to know or that you just like and you don't know why, you should try and keep a list of it. That's one way of really improving your vocabulary, but really improving your understanding of how to read poetry. Um, what I'd invite you to do is now pause and work on how you would zoom into these words and analyze uh, words like Mark and Mark's Weakness, woe, uh, that image of mine forged. You might want to look up forge, um, and it's not necessarily forgery, but it could be um, to think about the blacksmith forging something in metal. Um, uh, the, the idea of curse and blight and plague, and that that paradox, that contradiction of marriage. Hearse. If you could, if you could zoom into those words and practice your analysis, that would be very good training for you for reading poetry closer and to respond to it in a deeper way. So again, if you want to pause now, I'd invite you to do that. 
Okay, so once again, what we do when we read a poem is we try and commit to some journal writing. So what I've done is I, for this one in the booklet on page 13, I've given you a model for some of the things I would have talked about. So I'm just going to read them out to you to give you some ideas. I think the repetition and the simplicity of language in the first stanza and the rhyme give the sense of a children's song. But this contrasts with the image of the mind forged manacles. This gives me an image of handcuffs and slavery and the way that we create our own sense of control. The speaker can hear this in everyone's voice and sees this in everyone's face. Okay, so that's a basic response that I could make. Um, the speaker, so if I want to find another part of the poem and try and respond without quotations. The speaker seems to have supernatural sight and hearing. His visions and hallucinations help him see the hypocrisy and brutality of the world. Children are forced to work. Soldiers sacrifice their bodies for the wars of kings. I think that Blake shows anger and annoyance without directly swearing or naming his enemy. There's another way of responding, which would be to pick a pattern of keywords and devices and comment on what they make you think. The final stanza is haunting and frightening. The young girl swearing and cursing the birth of a child is a kind of disease that rots London to the core. Curse, blast, blights, plagues. London is rotten and destructive. It is unfair and broken, and the suffering seems endless. The last thing, and I'm going to do that in a second, is show you the piece of creative writing that I would do if I was turning London into a modern piece of writing. But if you could just pause here and think about what you would... Um, um, in fact, I'm going to do this first. Um, if you just want to pause here and think about uh, which of those types of journal um, models work for you, and if you could just respond to London, if you could just spend five minutes, you can use evidence or not. It's you responding to po Blake's poem, London. And you have to practice doing this if you're going to become a better writer and if you're going to become a better reader. This step is crucial because it's your ideas, your questions, the things you need to understand. And you need to practice doing that. So if you could pause now and do that. No more than five minutes. Set a timer. Okay. Now that you've done that, let's move to thinking about what is, what is this poem to today? <clears throat> Where do we hear these mind forward manacles? Where do we see marks of weakness, marks of mo woe, um, soldiers, blood, poverty, the youthful harlot's curse? Where do we see these things? This is worth thinking about. What do these things mean today? We have the Brixton riots. We have, um, we have uh, in Tower Hamlets, we have protests against racism. We have the riots uh, of the, uh, what was it, 2010, I think, uh, 2011? Riots, um, Brixton riots. Again, back to Robert Frentz's picture of London from um, post-war London. It's misery and... Um, darkness. Um, all of these are images that you can keep thinking about London and they can keep evoking in your mind different Londons. Um, when I want you to write a piece of creative writing, I want you to think about some of the lines from the poem you could use. But here are some questions I want you to think about. What does Blake Speaker notice about the faces of people in London? What kind of faces do you see in London? What sounds does Blake hear? What kind of sounds would you hear? Um, what would a modern equivalent of that final imager imagery be? These are just questions to get you started. Okay, so now I want you to write a piece of creative writing, transforming London into a prose piece. But to give you a start, I'm going to read you mine. Okay, so this is, this is the model. The city is controlled. Every inch of it is mapped out, plotted and charted on a map. It is a place where all the men and women are pinned like insects to a dissection board. It is damp, heavy, and miserable morning. I drag my boots through the streets of London, the sound of marching in unison, the sounds of silence punctuated with soft grunts, the sound of silence. Every face I see, every look at, everyone I look at seems weak. They are marked by weakness. Whoa, man, chill. No, I can't chill anymore. These are faces drenched in sadness, woe and misery. London, what have you done? London, your children need help. Your people are bleeding. They are lost and pressed and compressed. In the tube, I, the silence strangles me. 
The silence now is a drone. I am drowning in stale air. In the silence I hear clanging. I hear the chains dragging. I hear how the ball and chain that we all drag up and down the escalator. I hear how we make the handcuffs, how we make the manacles with our own hands. I hear how with glee we seem to lock up all our hopes and dreams. Work like a robot, rain like blood, keep sliding down in streaks down the windows. School children drag their work to and from red brick prisons. The priests tell us not to worry. God loves us. God loves London. God loves you. <coughs> in darkness, I trudge my soul back home. In the alleyways, on the pavement, on our doorstep, they sleep, they dream, they swear and curse. Children pulverized by rain. Cold and in need, they scream. They bleat and blast and hurl the curses. The young and homeless are plagues. They are zombies or the night. The undead come to upturn marriage hearses. London, God loves you. Okay, so that was my version of turning London into a prose kind of piece. Um, here's what you need to do if you, when you write yours. You need to use the poem to imagine a scene. You need to use language, imagery, and structure from the poem. And think about, you could, you, you could even structure your piece using the structure of the poem. You should, you should brainstorm ideas. You should plan. You should write and explore your feelings. And then you should try and edit what it is that you've written. Okay? And the success criteria we're looking for are clear structure, um, imagery and language from the poem, Use the exemplar to help start you off. Um, by no means is it perfect, but if you're looking for something to get you going, it, you can use it for sure. You want to create an atmosphere, create emotions, and s explore your feelings about London. This is particular. This this might be particularly pertinent now, under the lockdown in London, right now, um, to imagine what it would be like to walk around. So. I'd like you to pause. I mean, this is the long activity. This is the one that you're actually building up to because the end of this unit is a creative writing um, uh, exercise where you're bringing together your best pieces of creative writing. Creative writing is going to be an important way <coughs> to enter and explore these poems. And creative writing is something you have to do in the GCSE language paper. And what we're hoping is that by practicing it, by using literature to enhance your creative writing, when you get to that, you'll be writing things that aren't horrifically boring. Um, so please take this opportunity to pause. This is your exercise. This is the extended task. <coughs> you should spend at least half an hour on this, hopefully more, if you want to write something strong. So to end. Um, you've looked at some of Blake's poems today, and you've read uh, two of his poems. You've learned to predict, read, and annotate. You've thought about how to read structure and language. You've had personal responses, and now you've had an extended creative response. Stretch. I want you to think about what styles and techniques would you expect from a Blake poem? Um, how is a Blake poem similar or different to a Shelley poem? That's something you can think about. Um, and what are more of his poems that you can read? Because the more of Blake's poems you read, um, the more you'll really understand his style, his outlook. Um, he's an absolute genius. Uh, poems of Innocence and Experience is a masterwork, and you should read it, and you should know all of it. And you can find it anywhere online, and you can read it um, in detail. A child can read it, an adult can read it, an old man can read it, a highly literary person can read it, a totally... Um, disinterested person can read you. It's 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 truly truly uh, one of the more remarkable books of poetry ever written, um, and so that's what we've done today. Um, now you've done one week. You've done Shelley and Blake. In the next lesson, we'll be doing Wordsworth. Um, I hope that this is helping you keep up with your GCSE poetry and keeping you involved and keeping you engaged. I hope you're learning something. Um, and if you do these lessons and you follow along in your booklet, you will be keeping up with your learning. So I look forward to hearing from you soon.